Welcome to the Health Hackers Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Atkinson, and today my guest is Zane Griggs of Zane Griggs Fitness. Zane is a performance and longevity coach. He's a certified personal trainer for more than 20 years, and he's also the host of the Hunger Hunt Feast Podcast. Zane, welcome to the show. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you asking me on here. Yes, sir. Um, so you and I, it looks like uh, in the social media world, we follow a lot of similar accounts. We've got yep. a lot of mutual followers. I see us commenting on people's posts from time to time. It seems like we're aligned on a lot of things. So that's why I want to have you on the show today. Before we get into uh, the topics too much, I do want to direct people to connect with you on Instagram at Zane Griggs Fitness. That's G-R-I-G-G-S. Uh, they can also go to your link tree. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Zane Griggs Fitness. And there they can find out about some of the books that you've written, such as The Low Carb Lifestyle and Weight Loss Made Simple and some upcoming projects that you're also working on. Thank so, you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, I was hoping we would have co-host uh, Danny here today, but I don't know if he's going to join us mid uh, broadcast or not. But uh, he confided in me, and this I, I agree. Uh, we're all sick to death of these Marvel comics movie adaptations that seem to just be <laughs> churning out at a nauseating pace now. I mean, it was, it was fun to begin with, but enough is enough. Every great superhero has an origin story. So let's just start with yours. What What is Zane Gregg's origin story? What are you all about? What's your overriding philosophy or history? That you can oh share. wow! Well, uh, origin. I mean, I was uh, I was in my twenties, and I really was my interest in nutrition and health really wasn't sports driven. It, it was really about longevity. I kind of started lifting in college, and then really started thinking about longevity, how to avoid disease, and uh, so experimenting with different diets. I mean, just experimenting with food, and this is this is you know early 90s. So we didn't have the internet. We couldn't just look up any, there weren't blogs. We couldn't just look up research whenever we felt like it, like we can now. It wasn't a, a big social media platform where we could all huddle together and kind of exchange information. It was a lot of, you know, read the book, trial and error, you know, maybe uh, ask, find someone you think seems to know what they're talking about, ask them 20 questions. And so I found myself asking trainers a bunch of questions every time I ran into them and reading books, again, playing with diets, and uh, realized, you know, maybe I want to go in this direction professionally and just start working in that way. Got to go to certification, just start working with people. Of course, you know, working with other people versus working just with your own body, very different. You, you learn a lot more as you start working with other people's issues, right? And the things that they have to hurt on, their bodies don't respond the same way yours do, um, especially with older clients. At the time I was in my 20s, um, start working with someone in their 40s. It's a different animal, right? It's a very different thing. So, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed um, helping people in that way, but I found that the nutrition guidelines, so basically everything we were told about how we're supposed to eat to either whether it's your weight loss or long-term health, it was just dead wrong. It certainly didn't work for anyone over 40 at all, but it was really taking us in the wrong direction. And so it's starting to dig deeper, like I said, experimenting, trial and error, realized just how wrong they were and that led me down the path of low carb and then intermittent fasting in 2010 and and, and, and playing with that and helping my clients kind of work that into their routine when it was appropriate um, and then really get digging deeper into nutrient density and 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 what's a you know a really nutrient dense diet rather than a, rather than energy dense you know we want a, a, a right. diet that is for longevity a diet that avoids disease um, that may be modified somewhat individually for some people, but there's some general principles that work across the board for long-term health. And that's really where it's been like, and, and, and realizing that this are at least probably in my lifetime, I don't, I don't know, but the general nutrition guidelines have been bought and paid for. They've been taken over by processed food. And we've seen studies and, and, and articles come out in the last year even showing just how true that is, that you, we had uh, the committee to uh, create our nutrition guidelines. We had 
uh, like a 95% conflict of interest. 95% of them had a conflict of interest with processed food companies and our nutrition or our dietetics, uh, it's a nutrition academy or academy of nutrition and, and dietetics is, is, uh, is really not only invested and not only sponsored by the processed food companies, but it itself has investments within pro the largest processed food companies. They benefit, they profit when those processed food companies make money. Absolutely. And so there, that's a huge conflict of interest with the people who are writing our nutrition guidelines and creating, creating the uh, nutrition education for our nutritionists, RDs, what our doctors hear, what little nutrition advice they get in med school, which is a handful of hours, is just dead wrong. And so um, that kind of angers me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. you know me it too. fuels a fire me let's too. say right to 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 sh to get the word out to share it it's like th this is what's working for me this is what there is evidence out there there is research out there that supports something other than what we've been told for the last 50 plus years it just doesn't get publicized it just doesn't get written about no and the dietary guidelines for americans that you're talking about i like yeah. to refer to that as a disinformation campaign it's basically right. false information, purposely false information. And the way I share that with clients is these guidelines were not created for health reasons. This is for financial profit. Right. It, you know, the big three ingredients that I like to have people avoid in their nutrition are sugar, flour and grains and industrial seed oils or AKA vegetable oils. The reason those are part of the guidelines or let's just look at specifically grains, a grain based diet. That's not a health recommendation. Right. What do, we, what do we grow in this country? Wheat, corn, oats, you know, grasses. soy. Yes, yeah, soy. That's a big one. Those things are easy to grow large amounts of, and they can be transformed into all types of food like products that have addictive properties. They can add just the right amount of salt or sugar to make it taste amazing. There's no yep. nutrition. So you come away, you know, as soon as you eat a bag of Doritos, First thing you want is another bag of Doritos, right? <laughs> right. You can't get enough of it. So, you know, I try to steer people away from that as well. And I see that as just being one of your foundational principles that I'm definitely in alignment with. Absolutely. The, um, processed food is, you know, basically the root of all metabolic disorder in this country or the majority of it, I would say. For sure. For sure. And we export it. We're oh, exporting absolutely. it. So it's, it's profit, not only internally, but externally outside this country. We're exporting it all over the world. Right. And, you know, and, and it's subsidized, heavily subsidized since the 70s, since those those three big crops right. since the 70s by our federal government, which is why they can grow it so cheap and export it and make so much cheap food. So our, our government's funding it. Um, the processed food companies are profiting from it. They're exporting to countries We're even we're undercutting even the farmers in many of these countries where we're exporting the grain itself, not even just the processed food, which is going all over the country, the fast food is going all over the country over the world, excuse me, and the processed food going all over the world, but we are sending grains out to countries and we're able to make it so cheap because of our federal subsidies that right. we're undercutting the local farmers and putting them out of work. Right. So it's criminal. It's well, absolutely criminal. I think it it, it should be. And you know, yeah. what, what we've ended up with is what I like to refer to as a sick care system. So we don't have a health care system in America, but right. there's a big alignment between what I call big F and P which is big food and big farm, okay? Yeah. Buddy, buddy on a lot of things. It's the roots and branches model, okay? So if you see your, you know, modern Western healthcare practitioner, they're going to address the branches of the tree, but neglect the roots, right? Yeah. They're just going to kind of trim it up and just, you know, give you a medication that you're just barely asymptomatic. We're never really addressing the root cause of the issue because, I think they know what the cause is and they're just trying to, you know, keep that to themselves because that's a, that's a huge revenue uh, stream. People with metabolic right. disorders, it, it's not a contagious disease. Okay. That's um, attacking right. the public. Like we kind of know what's causing this, but at the same time we enable that behavior. Uh, my personal experience, you know, getting into this profession I weighed in at my doctor's office at over 250 pounds. I was mm. beginning to have some symptoms of high blood pressure, borderline type 2 diabetic. My doctor's office notified me that I might try to lose some weight or the alternative would be to go on uh, blood pressure medication. 
I did not, I did not want to go down that road. So I'm, I'm very highly opposed to that model or system or way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Now they weren't able to provide me with any type of plan or program to actually get the results. And that led me to the uh, mental ascent here that, um, our healthcare system is not really set up to get people healthy. It's just a kind of a symptom prescription medication. For sure. And I don't know, you're probably aware of this, but I want to mention for our audience today, the word prescription, originally you would go to your doctor and they would prescribe a regimen of behaviors that might include things like exercise or modifying your diet or improving your sleep quality or stress relieving type mm -hmm. things, you know, on and on and on. But we have devalued the word prescription to now it just means pharmaceutical. And, you know, right. the average doctor, I think, is down to about five or seven minutes uh, consultation with a patient yeah. just long enough to see what the symptoms are and give a medication and then move on to the next one. And that's the system that we're operating in. And that's the system that you and I are rallying against. And lots of other like minded people are also rallying against that. So um, I shared with you in our uh, uh, initial uh, just talk before we went on the air here about those three pillars, mindset, movement, and menu. We have alluded to the menu a little bit, but when it comes to uh, getting someone from a state where they're maybe experiencing metabolic disorder or they have uh, gained a lot of weight, they're having trouble, you know, metabolic issues, et cetera, I find that mindset is really the starting point because, you know, be the way our culture has become, People almost just expect to get sick when they get older. Um, right. You know, all their friends are sick, whatever. Uh, I mean, I say older population, but actually younger and younger now, people are starting to experience these type of problems. Yeah. It's really the length of time that we're exposed to the toxic environment, in particular the food environment. But um, I'm always trying to advocate that people come up with a reason. You know, what is their guiding reason behind what they're doing and why they want to make these healthy changes to sustain them through the process. Do you, do you have any like key mindset things that you work with, with clients that you're trying to get them to kind of change their thinking or their you know view of things? Well, I, I, I usually want to find out what they're, why they're doing it. So there you're the best person to start that with their conversation with whether it's to, I mean, I have a lot of guys, they want to continue in their career beyond their typical, they don't want to be sidelined by their health. They want to keep closing deals. They want to keep their business going. Uh, they want to be able to spend quality time with their families uh, and, and really take advantage of this time where maybe they're making a little more money than they did when they were in their 30s and 40s. And now they want to enjoy themselves and travel and do these things they, they weren't didn't have the time or money to do when they're younger. Mm -hmm. uh, and so find out what their big trigger is there and really say, look, you know, keep reminding them that this is what's going to keep you in the game. Essentially, this is going to keep you moving forward, being productive, not end up sidelined because you're taking half a dozen meds and having to, you know, take rest days because your your blood pressure's, you know, through the roof, uh, or put you in a hospital because you have an event, you know, and and really, as well with with the way they take it on, many people get worried, especially those kind of high performance guys. They start immediately looking for like results, like they want immediate uh, change, either it's on the scale or on their waist size. And it's like, let's start with habits. If you start the habits changes, the health will follow. And so we look at habits, we look at blood work and start thinking about, OK, th these are the these are the targets. It's not just the scale. The scale is kind of a. Uh, I think a lagging indicator, if anything else, it really, it's, it's usually one of the last things to kind of start seeing changes in many people, especially as we get older. Uh, but it's not the best indicator of change. And so if we can look at blood work, but really start with habit changes, like it in the way they eat, in the way they're, how often they're moving, is their sleep improved? And so um, changing those habits will get them and making those habits sustainable or like work within their um, their schedule and with their work schedule and their family life in a way that they can continue to maintain it. They'll, they'll feel like they've taken on a new part-time job in their health endeavor. They're, they're really making changes that then they start seeing they feel better. They have better performance. They're sleeping better. Uh, 
And it's not all about those immediate aesthetic changes, which can come, but um, to, to really keep them moving forward, it's like, let's, let's focus on habit changes and call those wins. When you have sustained that, those new habits for two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, those are wins because that's, what's going to get you where you want to go rather than just worrying about numbers on a, on a scale or, you know, the measurement around your waist. Um, and then those things start happening. Then, you know, the, the, the aesthetic changes start happening, uh, which are important, but they usually follow the habit changes. And so put, putting emphasis on habits and what their ultimate benefits going to be and keeping those, you know, front of mind all the time really seems to be uh, helpful in the beginning when it's really hard to make those changes and they have to, they have to break old, right. old ways, you know. Sometimes it's like waking someone up out of a slumber, you know, when you start mentioning things like, hey, the guy, the dietary guidelines are totally wrong. Like everything you believe is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I find that when someone moves from the area of maybe someday I'll make a change or I'd like to shape up or get healthy or, you mm -hmm. know, the tone up or whatever phrase they like to use. When it goes from that, usually I run a body scan on someone. You know, this is what we do professionally, use a tenita in body to determine body fat percentages and other health markers. Like you said, you do blood work um, that usually will catch someone's attention. But when you see it in black and white and now we have a minimum target to move from where you are to just get into the healthy range. So right. now we're going to a definite goal and a deadline and a reason. And now you've got a, a game plan to get there and some type of community to support you along the way. I feel like those are all essential elements of a transformation program. Most mm -hmm. people are going to default to where they feel the pain. You know, for me, it was high blood pressure. Okay. I right. didn't want to have high blood pressure. Not to mention though, when I look at my photos, I, I, you know, I wasn't looking great. I wasn't feeling great across the board, but that was what really got my attention was a diagnosis of a, a health concern, you know? So I think uh, when someone becomes aware of the condition all of a sudden, then they can start making positive changes, but that change is going to be based on accurate information. Right. You, you mentioned your search in your early years of, of speaking with trainers. They may have provided some information that wasn't entirely accurate. Or For sure. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, that, that would really move us to our, our next area that I wanted to talk about was the area of movement. So, what type of training style do you use personally or, or with clients? Um, what's your guiding philosophy? Is it going to be like a combination of a strength training and, and cardiovascular endurance type training? Or what uh, what kind of parameters do you use to you know construct a program for yourself or for a client? Well, uh, with clients, I really have to look at what their limitations are, of course, and, okay. and what, what they're able to do, what they're able to take on. Uh, but, but some level of resistance training is vital mm -hmm. for everyone just especially as we're aging to maintain muscle mass and have a place for the glucose to go have a place for glucose but other than fat cells right, right. uh but but exactly. to help people just move better feel better get rid of some stress um maintain some muscle mass as we age right. we need some resistance training now that doesn't and again it has to be tapered for the person but uh Personally, I found uh, mobility to add to that um, has become more important to me as I've gotten older. Things start stiffening up, you know, connective tissue is not as pliable as it used to be. So I'm moving through, trying to work through greater ranges of motion and backing off on the weight a little bit personally in many of my workouts. So, and, and movement or range, I'm making, putting that a priority over the amount of weight on the bar in, in many of my movements or moving my body, just, just body weight, but move for a great, through a greater range of motion to improve that mobility. Cause so many guys, especially um, as we get older, you see the guys who continue to lift heavy, 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 heavy as we get older, they might have joint issues or they tend to walk like robots, you know, they're a little bit stiff. Um, I didn't want that to be me. And so with many of my clients being uh, well over 40, mm -hmm. 40 to 60, most of them, uh, that is something I try to I try to work in along with um, some some level of circuit training. So we get a benefit of keeping our heart rate up, 
but moving through a series of, of resistance training movements that might be an upper body, a lower body, and then a core, one after the other, circuiting through, rotating through those, we get a lot of work done in a short period of time mm -hmm. that keeps our heart rate elevated. So we get some of that stamina challenged, um, heart rate, usually they're in the zone two range through that strength training. Uh, sometimes if, it's, you know, really put, depending on the movement, it's a big compound movement, like a, a squat, um, or some kind of deadlift or something that's a little bit heavier, right. then yeah, their heart rate will come up out of that for, for a few, you know, a minute or something like that. But, um, but for the most part, it's, it's kind of a fast paced resistance training. Okay. I found works really well to kind of thread the needle on getting for the time that I have with them, um, some strength some stamina and then prescribe to them. Hey, if you want to, you know, a lot of times I would train people in their home. I use most of my, my clients, I train in their own, in their home. So they have a little bit of a gym space or some equipment. Okay. You can come here and do a few, ba these few basic movements to help you when we're not meeting. That's great. If you can get some cardio in uh, one or two other days a week, whether it's going for a walk or getting on your spin bike, whatever it is, just, just check the box, just get 20 minutes, 30 minutes in because it's building those habits until it becomes more of something that they desire. And I know once, if, once they do that for a number of weeks, if they miss it, they'll actually notice that they missed it. They'll, they'll, they'll miss that feeling that they get from being consistent with their exercise. And so until it becomes a habit, um, I try to make it sustainable in the way that like, it's not going to be a huge time investment for them just to get them moving more days of the week than not in some way it doesn't have yeah. nothing specific but but yeah some level of resistance training even if it's 15 minutes on their own or some kind of light moderate uh strength training for those who want a little bit more yeah i mean sprinting is a fantastic okay. uh high intensity movement if you can get outside and do it because it gets you out it gets you moving or any kind of um high intensity interval training for those who are willing to do it with a, a bike or elliptical, whatever it is they have in their home. But just getting that heart rate up out of that comfortable zone for even a 30 seconds to a minute is really beneficial. But again, it depends on where they are with their own fitness level. Right. But the fast paced strength training really starts to build that, that stamina and, and help them retain muscle as well. Um, and it, I find that they, um, they get that, that, really i think empowers them to do a little bit more on their own just because they, if they've overcome this workout then they can certainly do a little bite-sized piece of that on their own right. and it's not going to be um it's not as intimidating yeah oh i agree so sound philosophy for sure um so we mentioned earlier that you're the host of the hunger hunt feast podcast so can you kind of decode that or break that hunger hunt feast down a little bit? It sounds like uh, intermittent fasting, if I'm understanding correctly. You're yeah, a little bit. It started with yeah, intermittent okay. fasting. Okay. And then um, hunt being movement, you know, okay. and fasted okay. movement, some sure. fasted exercise, and then feast being hey, this now it's time to eat. Let's eat. Okay. Uh, but yeah. not 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 grazing. It's let's have a good okay. meal. Okay. And then we stop eating for a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We have a meal that's satisfying, that's nutrient dense, right. and then we don't eat. Um, funny thing, in the last uh, several months, I've really decided to rebrand that podcast. So that's sort of in a okay. in an archive with um, something I did for. I started when when you know when everything started shutting down. I'm like, oh, anyway, time to start a podcast. Right. So it was about 2021, I guess. So um, or 20 2020. And, uh, it was just, it was a, it was a passion move. You know, it was just something I just wanted to do yeah. and kind of get my ideas out in a way to express them and bring on guests to, to converse, especially when, when things were shut down, a lot of people were available. Yeah. Uh, and now I've, I've, I've started rebranding and I'm going to launch a new podcast here in the next, uh, six weeks or so called the healthy AF podcast. <laughs> okay. So AF being healthy after 50, but of course I let people, uh, 
you know, they can they can interpret AF as they choose, whether it's after 40 or whatever else motivates them. <laughs> right. But officially healthy after 50 okay. podcast. Okay. And that's that's a it's a, yeah, it's been a message that's been resonating with people. I started talking about uh, using that phrase in, in this last in, in 22. Um and it really seemed to resonate with people. So I'm like, let's let's keep moving this direction because I, I'm 52 and uh health beyond you know 48 50 50 you know that's that's where things start to get funky they start to get difficult where you start to encounter basically you start paying for the sins of your 30s and 40s is is okay. you know your nutritional sins so to speak as you as you start um noticing those uh issues with like blood pressure insulin resistance you know that i think that's when we we, we see the problems start to come up if we haven't been addressing our health and it doesn't have to be that way. Right. It, it doesn't, you can be a healthy 50, 60, 70 year old, not dependent on, I mean, take care of what you need to take care of. If you need meds to address an issue, whether it's genetic or it's lifestyle, if that's what you need for, at least for the time being to manage it, I'm certainly not trying to counter your doctor's advice, but at the same time, there's in most cases, there is a lifestyle, there's some lifestyle changes you can make to reverse that problem or prevent that problem and and get yourself you know where your body is is regulating blood sugar blood pressure um and just all of your metabolic hormones you know insulin your hunger hormones it, those can all are supposed to be regulated by how we eat how we move and we don't have to fall apart at 50 years old and, and, you know or even 60 right it's it's you can be and if you want to live a long time with a healthy with a with a health span not just a lifespan but a long health span right. it's not about living through disease it's about preventing disease not being diseased at all right you know you don't live a long time not people not too many people live a long time or have a long health span with heart disease the people that tend to live into their 90s just really don't get severe heart disease right, right. They, they might have some symptoms coming on or they just part of age but they're getting them a lot later than everybody else right right <laughs> well in the in the eight minutes or so that we have remaining uh no. we can again talk about the uh you said hormones you know that kind of my radar went off when you said hormones sure some of these food-like products that we mentioned earlier uh, actually contain hormone disruptors um so the endocrine system, yeah, is very complex. And, and we think, usually when we say hormones, we think of sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. Right. But right. insulin is a hormone. Ghrelin and leptin are hormones. And these are things that regulate appetite and energy. So Correct. getting those in the proper state, I think, is key to getting the whole thing under control. What's, uh, what are some of your thoughts about the, the hormonal uh, you know, regulation and so forth? Like best practices, I guess I would say. Well, I would say infrequent eating. So basically two or maybe three meals a day. Okay. I have one, one day a week. I do one meal. I do just dinner yeah, and that's just to that. kind of keep me primed, you know, like to, yeah. to, 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 to help my, uh, it's like a workout for my fat burning metabolism for my, for my metabolic system, right. To just be able to process fats effectively, go about my day. Uh, but I think we eat, generally speaking, we eat too often. We eat the wrong foods. And the wrong foods tend to stimulate the hunger anyway. So I try to eat very nutrient dense, uh, animal based foods oh, for sure. infrequently, you know, so and, uh, infrequently, I mean like not five, six times a day, okay. two or three meals a day, very nutrient dense, and then go several right. hours without eating again, okay. you know, and without snacking, because every time you snack, your insulin levels go up because your blood sugar goes up and then you're blocking fat burn. So when you get, you need to be able to, you know, eat a meal, you know, insulin goes up, comes back down, especially if you have a lower carb, higher protein meal, you're, you're, you have very little increase in insulin. It's for a shorter period of time. And if you ate like say pizza, right. for instance, right. uh, and so keeping, getting that insulin level back to normal ranges, allowing your body to, to burn fat during that time and, and function normally because your liver is supposed to be regulating your blood sugar, right. not your snacking. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Surprise, and that's a surprise to many fitness professionals. I mean, I've talked to so many, even PhDs, who said, "Oh, you have to. They have to snack in order to keep their blood sugar stable." Really? Right. I thought that was the liver's job, you know. <laughs> so I mean, 
it, we should be able to get through four, five, six hours without our blood sugar crashing, without eating very easily, yeah. very easily. If, if, so uh, to me, you start with how often you're eating, what you're eating, and then eliminating the toxins, like you mentioned, the processed grains, processed sugars, and the seed oils, which all have an impact on insulin <laughs> and hunger and insulin resistance, especially um, with those seed oils, they really have an impact on insulin resistance at the liver. They affect our mitochondrial health. Mm -hmm. They create low energy. They're, they're linked to fatty liver, insulin resistance, low testosterone. Uh, you really, and, and, and uh, arterial plaque. Because the arterial, what we see in the arterial plaque is uh, oxidized linoleic acid, basically. So that the those that seed oil has a specific fatty acid in it called linoleic acid, mm -hmm. and it gets easily oxidized. Whether it's sitting in a jar in the food or in our bodies, it's easily oxidized, and that starts our plaque. So I don't want I don't want to go long on too far right. down the rabbit hole. But when we have that kind of toxin that's highly oxidized and highly inflammatory in our bodies that's going to create inflammation in all sorts of areas, organs, like our liver and our heart. Right. And that's going to have an impact on those insulin, on cortisol, on stress response, mm -hmm. um, inflammatory response. So our immune system is going to be just responding to that. Right. And that has a downstream effect on our body's ability to just function properly, to create energy. And what happens when we have low energy or we don't feel good or we're stressed out? Most people eat more and they wow. go for comfort food so it's this cycle that like you said it drives itself you can't just have one bag of doritos well <laughs> it it it's it's the the whole the whole you know gamut of processed food not only does it does it feed its own appetite within us but it, it feeds its its disease process as well i agree zane griggs thank you so much for joining us today very well said I mentioned earlier, you do have a book, at least one book on Amazon. People can just uh, look you up on Amazon.com. You have an author page. They, there. they can. They can. Although, I, 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 as I mentioned to you, that, that one was probably from five years ago. So okay. I, okay. Right. But I don't think it's it's not bad. It's just right. not current. <laughs> current uh, the book right. coming out in March uh, would be okay. probably more what I would recommend. It's geared towards men over 50. Okay. And, and that's your uh, new book. That's your new book coming out in March. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It has not, has not been released. It's, it'll be available uh, right now. The date's March. <laughs> okay. Well, we will definitely be looking for that. Uh, any, uh, any parting words, any projects you have going, you want to talk about or uh, direct people to, you know, it's um, I'm launching the healthy AF podcast. I got the book coming out and I'm, I'm at the, from that point being, being with a family and all, I'm, I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs. So that's, those pretty much, those are the two things I, I would uh, like to, let people know are, are coming coming down the pike uh and i appreciate anyone who wants to follow me on instagram i i look forward to the i appreciate the support and I look forward to any questions you might have about what i post okay well thank you very much sir we appreciate that and uh, that's you. all for now that's all for today folks this uh episode will be available in the very near future as an audio only version but you can uh hopefully you're watching this on youtube so uh, check out the audio only version and also Healthy AF Podcast. Subscribe. That's it.